View series. Take a load off from your busy workday and listen to the dulcet tunes of our guests who are all over the cybersecurity landscape. We're going to ask them some hard questions, not going to lie, probably some softballs too. But no matter what, it's going to be a good time. So sit back, pour yourself a nice hot cup of coffee, or something stronger if it's that time of day, and enjoy Coffee Talk with Serge. Well, hello. Joining me today is Sydney Howard, and she is the Principal Threat Hunter at Splunk. Very excited to have you on for Coffee Talk, uh, the interview series. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your role at Splunk, how you got to where you are, and um, I guess, where do you want to start with with your career journey and, and how you got here or kind of what you're doing currently? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about my career journey and where I started. So um, my my first role in security uh, started about about nine years ago. That's kind of almost how long I've been in security. Um, and right before that, um, I had graduated college and I got a job um, at a place I was interning at as an IT rotational analyst. So um, what I did is I rotated through various IT teams to see really what I liked and where I wanted to pursue my career. So I did things like desktop support where I was crawling under a uh, desk and fixing computers, um, you know, network support. So I was working with routers and switches servers. I was uh, racking and stacking those, which is uh, quite an experience and very different because you're, that was like the on-prem days, um, but very fun nonetheless. And once I got to the end of a lot of those IT rotations, I didn't really, there wasn't really anything, anything I loved. So I knew I wanted to stay in technology, but there was nothing that really called to me. And so my manager at the time suggested I do a rotation in security. And so I was like, sure, why not? It sounds interesting. And um, I got to rotate through a couple different teams within security. I did like security awareness and training. So we did like phishing tests. Um, We taught employees on how to be secure uh, for themselves and the company. Um, I got to do uh, compliance work, which um, isn't the most fun, um, but it is something that is extremely needed in each company. Each company has their own uh, regulations that they have to adhere to. And then the last piece of it was in an operational role. So it was a smaller company. Um, It was um, a local utility company here in Arizona. So they did a lot. The operational team did like SOC, IR, forensics, all the tool management kind of between a few people. Um, So my main thing I started with was just working tickets. So responding to alerts, um, dealing with those, determining if the activity was suspicious or not. Um, It was quite the learning experience, but I loved it. I was like, this is it. I want to do this. Um, There was something new every day, and I was like constantly learning, which I am just a huge fan of. I'm still now. Um, So I kind of ran with that. Um, And from there, I worked there for about two years in security, and then I've hopped between a few places, um, primarily doing blue team work. So um, all still operational, doing like instant response. I've been on a few of those teams, doing a lot of forensics. Uh, A couple other areas I've been interested in is SOAR. So I set up SOAR at a few different places. I love automation. Um, I worked in a couple of different industries. So I worked in utility. I worked in retail, um, a technology company. Um, And then more recently, before I came to Splunk, I worked at a company called Lumen, um, formerly known as CenturyLink. There's a big ISP in um, the United States, but they're a global company. Um, I was on their IR team. And we convinced the manager to uh, create a threat hunting team. So three of us started that team. We founded the program. We s- developed it from nothing. So we created a vision, a strategy, all the processes, and it really took off. And we were really successful. Um, before I came to Splunk, I led that uh, team, um, which was really fun. I learned a lot about threat hunting there. Um, and that's really what brought me to Splunk. I've been at Splunk for about two and a half years, almost two and a half years. Um, I've always been on the writing team. I started um, as a senior. I was promoted last year to a principal, um, but that's kind of my journey to today. Um, really loving what I do. I love Splunk as well. So I could uh, gush about them all day. 
Yeah. And that's, that's really interesting. All the different facets that you've done all the way from, you mm -hmm. know, just, you know, network architecture, right. To, to, you know, working in a SOC type environment to starting up a threat hunting team. And I'm curious, you know, your decision to, to go into threat hunting was that, I mean, what attracted you to that? Was it the proactive nature of threat hunting or um, did you see like a need for it that needed to, to be filled in, in that previous role? So there were a couple of things I'd say, um, the big one is that I would work incidents and I would get to the end and we'd have to close out the incident. And I always wanted to learn more. I'd be like, well, I want to learn more about this technique. Um, but because you're working in certain spots, there's always a fire. You can't really do that. You don't have time to. So, um, that's what kind of drove me towards threat hunting is because when we doing, when we're doing threat hunting, we are becoming like sneeze in whatever topic we're threat hunting. Um, and that is really fun. So I'm constantly learning about new things every day. Even now I pick up a hunt and I'm like, I don't know anything about this technique, but I'm going to by the end. Um, another part of it, honestly, is just, uh, instant response is so reactive and it's, um, easy to burn out in it. So, um, I was trying to pivot to something that was similar. I could still, um, be in the weeds and doing a lot of technical work. Um, but it was a little more proactive. Um, and I wasn't on call. That was like a big perk too. Yeah, definitely. You know, work-life balance, I'm sure that plays a yes. role in with threat oh, yeah. yeah, the proactive nature of it and trying to get ahead of threats, um, you know, that maybe weren't detected initially. So I'm guess I'm, I'm kind of curious in your current role is day to day, is it kind of the same? Is it structured the same or does it kind of depend on, on what you want to look into? It really just depends, um, on like typically I'm hunting. Um, I have some hunt going on and it depends where I'm at in that hunt in that whole, um, process of hunting. Am I doing research? Am I actually like executing SPL and looking for bad things? Am I writing the outputs, like making detections or reports? So it can vary like somewhere in that process. Um, we do a lot of solo work and part of threat hunting. We do some collaborative, but, um, that's kind of the day-to-day -day for hunting in general. Now, for me personally, um, at Splunk, I own the Purple Team service. So um, that is a big part of my role, um, like outside of just threat hunting. Um, so it's been around for about a um, little over a year now. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Purple Team is uh, when you have your red and blue teams collaborating to uh, simulate some sort of threat against your environment. So there's really two goals in mind as part of this. Uh, the first one is collaboration between your red and blue teams. So your red being your pen testers, your blue being your instant response, your SOC, detection engineering, threat intelligence, threat hunting, um, all those teams. Uh, typically, they're not talking to each other, the red and blue, not at all. They're not sharing reports or outputs of anything um, at most companies. So this is a way to break down those two silos between the teams and get them talking because they both have a lot of different knowledge that like it overlaps in a lot of ways, but um, they still don't share it enough. Uh, and then the second goal with purple teaming is just to test your defenses. It's as simple as that. Um, a lot of times we are not testing our controls on our hosts, our network. So your host may have EDR, your networks can have like firewalls, proxy, et cetera, but we're not testing to see if those things are working all the time. Um, the red team may be testing, but they don't always be sharing. And this is our chance to do it all together. So the red team can emulate some sort of technique or a full blown attack. And the blue team can be that it'd be like, oh, well, we see this. We don't see this. You know, this is what the logging looks like. And you can just share your knowledge. Um, and it's really a great experience for everyone. Um, there's a lot of learning involved, a lot of collaboration. Um, so I've got, been fortunate to have a lot of support from all the teams here at Splunk because uh, purple team is not anyone's daily role. It's kind of like a support role. So um, having a lot of great people back me has been uh, really made the program successful. 
Absolutely. I'm sure there's a huge teamwork component with purple teaming. You're bringing in so many different teams and trying to coordinate that I'm sure is, um, is, is interesting. And it sounds like very helpful for anyone watching whose company might be considering starting purple teaming. Is there like a, a cadence with that? Do you try to do it quarterly or how frequently do you recommend trying to, to get those teams together to, um, to collaborate? It, it really just depends on your resources. Um, we try to do at least one or two every quarter, um, but that just will depend on projects and other work that's going on. Um, we, we meet regularly to chat about planning for upcoming exercises and any process work that needs to be done. Um, but it's really just going to depend on your appetite. Uh, we've based a lot of our processes and framework off of what site has put out there. So their purple team framework is fantastic. Um, I would check it out if you're interested in purple teaming, want to know a little bit more about all the different roles that um, you need as part of it. Uh, and yep. Perfect. I also wanted to point out right over your shoulder is Blue Nomicon, which uh, oh, yeah. you were one of the featured authors. <laughs> and for anyone watching, Blue Nomicon is a book that uh, Mick Boccio and Ryan Kovar recently worked together to publish. Uh, through the surge team and it has i think more than 20 different authors in sydney you are one of the authors which is really exciting um mm -hmm. in the practitioner category because we had categories for for leadership advice uh practitioners tales from the tent the trenches so to speak uh so when, when you were asked to contribute to this uh what was the the process like on deciding on what you wanted to focus on for your your essay so my process i was I was trying to think of what I have hunted and dug into recently. Um, and the a big topic that I have really been interested in probably in the past year or so has been um, Mac OS hunting throughout that, just understanding how uh, that operating system works and logs um, and what we can do to better protect it. So um, I just kind of took that idea and I um, expanded it a little bit so um, Mac OS and Linux OS are both based off Unix. Um, and so I thought I would write a essay on hunting in those two operating systems since they overlap. And um, anytime you're hunting or monitoring something, it's better to uh, have a little bit of a bigger scope. If you can cover multiple OSs, like that's bonus points for you uh, versus just covering like one. So that's kind of my thought behind that. But um, I talk a little bit about what you can hunt for. It's a lot of the uh, popular commands that say an adversary might use on those uh, OSs that you can dig into. So I did keep the I did keep the SPL pretty simple in that um, because everyone's environment's different. Um, you're gonna have to tweak it to um, what you use uh, in your environment and what your employees are using. Um, but I thought it would be a good starting point for anyone who's just interested in looking more into those operating systems. Uh, traditionally, most folks are focused on Windows. If you look out there, all the research articles, detections are all on Windows, and uh, there's a huge lack of support for those other OSs. So I really um, wanted to share more about those and get people interested in those and maybe like a good starting point. Absolutely. And I think was it GTFO bins is is the the resource kind of a, a compilation of of different binaries and and ways that uh, those legitimate binaries with uh, Mac OS and Linux could then be abused by adversaries to sort of live off the land and and try to evade detection that way. Um, actually, since I wrote that, there's been another one that came out, and I talked about it in the last uh, security picks. I think it was last month. It's called Lubins, like living off the orchard, and that one's actually specifically focused on Mac OS, which I think is pretty cool. I know it's a very new repository, but I've seen them adding a lot to it, so I'd recommend checking that out too and keeping an eye on future. Awesome. And so I, I guess I wanted to ask if there are any other projects that you're working on, anything. I know that uh, David Bianco, I wanted to bring this up as well. David Bianco, he's a member of Surge and also has uh, quite a bit of threat hunting experience. And he's worked on a new framework, the PEAK framework, mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of, I guess, set, set a steps of what you can take uh, that you can repeat, repeatable steps for, for threat hunting. Is that something that you've tried to employ like in your own day-to-day -day work? And, and Definitely. So David shared the peak framework with um, the threat hunters within Splunk early on. So we got to review and provide feedback. And um, since 
he released the article and several to follow, uh, we've really been digging into those and we discussed as a team and we're have implemented that um, as part of our daily work. So uh, before we had our own framework, uh, which we actually just built in house uh, about a year ago, it was based on uh, squirrels, what they have put out there, which was a little dated. Um, we had kind of tweaked it for what we wanted. Um, so right now we're testing out using the uh, peak framework and also the able framework, which David talks about um, in one of his articles. Um, so far, we're really liking it. It's it's like a simplified version of um, kind of what's out there. And the the best thing I think um, that I've heard and that I think about it is that there's the multiple approaches to it. So threatening is there's not one way to do it. Uh, it there's so many different ways you could take it how you want to, um, but having the hypothesis driven, which is your just classic threat hunting, uh, the baseline threat hunting, and then also the model assisted threat hunting, the map, are really fantastic uh, for those that want to dive a little further into threat hunting and maybe have a little bit more mature uh, threat hunting operations. They can try this um, advanced approaches. Definitely. And we, we'll link to all of those blog posts because we have a series that we're working on and releasing those. Uh, so we'll definitely link to what we have. And I think PEAK is prepare, execute, and act with knowledge. So that's yes. that acronym. There's lots of acronyms that, that we're adding into the, the threat hunting mix, but um, mm -hmm. that's that's really exciting to hear that, that you've been able to use that and, and kind of see um, how that can relate to what you're currently working on. Well, awesome. Well, I think those are all the questions I had. Is there anything else you wanted to mention? Any other projects that you're that you're currently working on? Or, or I guess I did have one question. When it comes to starting a new hunt, right? So you've just finished a hunt. You're starting to look into what you want to do next. What kind of resources do you look at? How do you find inspiration on on where to to pivot and where to look? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, there are many different resources we use, I'd say uh, we try to be uh, very intel driven in our hunting um, and when we're developing hypotheses. So um, using our threat intel team members and some of their ideas that they send over is really um, the best way for us. Um, we'll do a little more research, but they've done a lot of the research on the threat and think, oh, this would be great to hunt. Um, so they shoot it over. Another great way is your other internal teams, like your SOC and your instant response team. So reaching out to those folks and asking if there is any threats that they have been continually seeing, um, any ideas of things that they think we should hunt for based off instance they've had recently. Um, also other teams like your detection engineering team, uh, they might have some great uh, hunt ideas. They're building detections that are a little more scoped, but they might have an idea for something that is a little broader and that the hunt can dig into first and then pass off those um, high fidelity detections to that team. Awesome. Well, that's, that's some great information. And I'm, you know, I'm, my background is not with threat hunting. So it's really interesting to hear kind of what a day in the life is like for you and, and kind of how you g navigate through, through different hunts. So that's, that's really mm -hmm. interesting. Well, great. Is there, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Any other projects, anything coming up that, that you're looking forward to? Um, for those of you coming to Conf this year, uh, I'm be speaking as part of a workshop uh, with a few different folks, include David Bianco on instant investigation and threat hunting. So uh, feel free to come and check that out. Yep, definitely. Awesome. And I think Conf is... July 17th is when that begins. I'll need to double check yep. that, but I believe yeah, July 17th. <laughs> it's hard to keep track of all these events, but very excited for Conf and, and, and seeing that as well. So thank you so much, Sydney, for taking the time to talk. And uh, we'll be sure to link to all of those blogs and all of that information in the comments as well. So thank you again.